6th of February 1952, a time when Winston Churchill was Prime Minister, Britain's first residential tower block had just opened and the latest car was the Austin A30. It was also the day that Princess Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth on the death of her father, George VI. She's the first British monarch to reign for 70 years and we have joining us two royal commentators to help put that reign into context. Victoria Howard and Richard Fitzwilliams join us from London. Good morning to you both. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, if I start with you first of all, Victoria, can you just explain what the royal role of royal consort is and why this intervention by the Queen is so significant? So, of course, much like Prince Philip, Camilla will fill a, fulfil a similar role. She will be very supportive. She will take, uh, undertake tours with Prince Charles. It's kind of very similar to what she does now. But the fact that the Queen has been so public in her support of Camilla is very significant because, of course, she has been a controversial figure. And for the Queen to throw her weight behind her to, to really make sure she is not Princess Consort, that she really is Queen Consort, that's a really big deal and it's kind of the Queen's stamp of approval and hopefully the public will follow suit. And, and Richard, talk to us a little bit about the role that Camilla will play and what kind of monarch she will be. Well, of course, as Queen Consort, she will be supportive of Charles when he's king. And the Queen, realising that this is controversial, and it certainly would have been had it been left, has in a far-sighted and perspicacious announcement, which was certainly dramatic, realised that this is now a fact. We know what her title is going to be and her role, as she sees it, has always been. On the one hand, she wants to support uh, the person of whom uh, she was once the non-negotiable partner. Also, there is the charitable aspect of her work. Uh, osteoporosis, domestic abuse and so on. And I think the British public have warmed to her. But there was this question about what her title would be and if it hadn't been settled, and I think that this is definitely final, uh, it would have probably been a good deal of controversy on this when Prince Charles became king and then subsequently in the months towards the coronation. Yeah, um, Victoria, I've seen it described this morning as the Queen future-proofing the monarchy. Is that a fair assessment? I think so. And, you know, you don't necessarily associate the institution of monarchy with kind of keeping up with, with trends and making sure that things are done quickly and reactively. But actually, the monarchy has to do that to survive. So the Queen actually backing Camilla in this way is very, very significant. And it does hopefully, or it will hopefully, sway that public opinion to go, do you know what? If the Queen can accept her, maybe we should too. You know, it's been over 20 years since the death of Diana, which is often considered the sticking point for anything based around Camilla. Um, so I think this is a move from the Queen to, to future-proof that monarchy and ha have uh, a really clean um, succession with Prince Charles when the time comes. Uh, and, and Richard, speaking of looking to the future, the Queen's Jubilee message um, was released last night. And in it, uh, the Queen has a very optimistic message about the future. She talks about the past seven decades having seen extraordinary social, technological and cultural progress that's benefited us all. And she expresses confidence that they'll be similar in the future. Absolutely. It's, she's a deeply religious person, but she's also undoubtedly an optimist. And throughout this message, you get the feeling that she has tremendous confidence in the way the nation's future will unfold in the peoples of Britain and the Commonwealth. But also, you know that this is a historic anniversary, that this really, as she looks back, as she must be reflecting on the remarkable service her father, George VI, gave, and she pays tribute, as expected, to her strength and stay, the Duke of Edinburgh, 73 years, and a remarkable partnership, partnership of uh, opposites in uh, the sense that the Queen is rather shy, cautious and conservative, and the Duke rather dynamic and experimental, and it was the combination of these two absolutely remarkable figures and their different character traits that have strengthened the monarchy and the nation. And of course, to have a monarchy which is above party 
politics during a pandemic too, where the Queen has broadcast so superbly virtually to the nation has been such a strength. Uh, and Victoria, the Queen also renewed the pledge she gave more than seven decades ago that her life will be devoted to service. And now that's one of the things that really holds her in people's affection, isn't it? This sense of tireless duty. Absolutely. I think many people consider her to be uh, one of that, the last ones of that older generation. I think there's always this thing where people suggest that the, the younger generation are you know, not as hardworking, not as committed, a bit, a bit lazier than um, their generation. And I think every, everyone, all generations, look up to the Queen for, for that duty. To have to do this job every day for 70 years is something else. You know, most people can't even imagine what 70 years looks like. So um, not only the, the monarchy that she has served, she also served her country in the ATS during the Second World War. So there's many things that people admire about the Queen, and I think this, this commitment and duty to her role is, is one of them, and that will be, I think, her lasting legacy. Um, Richard, the timing of this jubilee, very welcome, of course, maybe bringing the country together after a very difficult two years, but it's also been a very difficult few years for the royal family too. I'm thinking about events with Harry and Meghan and also events, of course, with Prince Andrew. Uh, talk to me about whether that casts some sort of shadow on these celebrations and what the palace will be hoping for from this year. Oh, well, there's no doubt at all that uh, it has been an extremely difficult period for the monarchy. I mean, there have been such periods in the past, in the 1860s, Queen Victoria's seclusion after Albert's tragic death, the abdication in 1936, the 1990s, which were, frankly, disastrous, and yet the Golden Jubilee uh, was such a success. And what we've had recently, of course, Andrew in total disgrace, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, uh, having stepped back only to step down and uh, been bitter. No question the palace will be looking for a commemoration in June where we can all celebrate with a nation which has been very tired and so many have suffered so after two years, over two years by then, of coronavirus restrictions in one way or another. There'll be a four-day celebration and at its centre will be someone who at 21 swore to serve her whole life and she has done so brilliantly. Um, we will speak again about this, I'm sure, today, just the first day uh, in what will be a year of celebrations. Uh, thank you for being with us both this morning, Richard Fitzwilliams and Victoria Howard. We're grateful for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you both.